the um, Facebook. Nah. All right. Just wait till it gets up there. The first one. All right. Amateurs. Messing with all my screenshots. You messed them all up, didn't you? Yeah. Well, you know, you start swinging around, though. Go over there to the soundboard. Just go. I love the way he just runs that finger up there.
I'm six minutes late. I'm sorry. Sorry. I, I just seen the, the, the clock there. But uh, Good morning. How are you guys doing? How's everybody doing? Good, 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 good. Good, good, good to hear that. I believe we're going to have a, a great service this morning. Uh, we've got a lot going on uh, here at Asbury. Uh, I, I pray that you've had a, a good week. Uh, if you have, we rejoice with you. If you've not, if you've had... Uh, a trying week, well then we're here to encourage you, and, and, and we believe this morning that uh, God has something in store for you, and so uh, we're excited about that. Um, <clears throat> and actually, I'm going to be uh, uh, preaching on uh, how we trust God during uh, difficult times, but a, a couple of announcements. Uh, first of all, the floors, the floors in here, it looks like they're going to be done the third week of February. Uh, yeah, yeah, so... Uh, Uh, thank you all. I mean, it's just an amazing job that everybody did uh, in coming together and raising the funds that was needed to put down uh, the laminate floors. And so it's going to look nice, but it's also serviceable, uh, you know, to where we can continue providing the meals and, and not have to worry about uh, getting the, the floor dirty and stained. And so it's going to look really nice. It's going to have uh, a nice traction to it. So thank you all for contributing to that. Uh, and, and we're excited about um, what that's going to look like and what that's going to feel like and, and how it's going to uh, really just improve um, just the experience here and improve God's, God's house. Also, we're excited to announce uh, that on Wednesday night, uh, starting this Wednesday night, we're having uh, the refresh service. So that's the midweek refresh service Wednesdays at 6.30. Uh, so we're going to start that uh, this coming Wednesday uh, we're introducing the midweek service, and so what that's going to look like, uh, it's going to be, uh, you know, like a, a church service, it's going to be more casual uh, and laid back in, in a way, there's going to be worship, uh, there's going to be uh, prayer requests and, and prayers, uh, there's going to be a, a Bible lesson, uh, and we're going to serve communion uh, throughout the week. And, and the reason that we've done this, right, because we're growing both numerically uh, corporately and also personally and spiritually. And so it's important, you know, uh, to have more than just one hour a week of connection. So we believe that, you know, you, you, you get charged up on, on Sunday and, and, and God moves uh, mightily in our midst, but oftentimes seven days is too long to wait to come together Again, so we felt like adding this midweek service introduces that other touch point or that other connection point when we need to be recharged, right? Mondays and Tuesdays can be very rough. They, they can be very tough. And so uh, a nice midweek service kind of amps up your battery, so to speak. I, I'm sure that's not out in, in context appropriately. But, but anyway, you know what I mean. You get refreshed, you get encouraged, uh, and then you can tackle Thursday and Friday and and then you're right back home on Sunday. So, Wednesday at 6.30, and look, this is a good opportunity to invite your unchurched friends, you know, uh, that, that don't go to church anywhere. Maybe they don't want to come to Sunday morning because they don't want to, you know, be made uh, to feel awkward or, 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 or pointed out or things like that. This is a nice entry point for a lot of people who otherwise... Uh, have some reluctancies to come to church on a Sunday morning. So invite your friends to come out to that. And again, that's this Wednesday at 6.30. Now, uh, most of you should have gotten a bulletin when you came in. Uh, and for the past three weeks, uh, we've asked three questions. And we've passed this out in the bulletin. And those three questions were, what do you wonder about, what do you worry about, and what do you wish for? And everybody has written down their responses to those three questions, and, and they've turned them in. And, and so what I've done is I've looked through all of those questions. They're all anonymous. I don't have any idea what any of the questions, who they were from. Not, not even one of them. And, and so I went through, for the, over the past three, to three weeks, uh, I've went through and looked at the questions, and uh, I've, I've put a theme out beside of them, what that uh, question relates to. And so I've tallied up the results, and collectively, there were 44 themes that you guys highlighted. And it's interesting, in the Bible, 
so if you add four and four together, you get, of course, the number eight. The number eight in the Bible represents new beginnings. And so, uh, and also I'm about to be 44 years old this year, so, so I thought that was pretty cool too. So there's 44 themes, right, that you guys have, have written down. And man, uh, going through some of these questions, right, they're, they're tough questions. They're serious questions, right? And we're going to tackle a couple of them this morning. But what I've done uh, in your bulletin, if you can't see the screen, it, it, it's a little bit small, but uh, Regina, thank you. Where's Re- Regina? Thank you for graphing this out. So you can see what the responses were. And so the most popular theme that people wondered about was salvation for their family. They've got brothers, sisters, sons or daughters or maybe parents who are not saved. And so 20% of the responses that came in were centered on that theme. So what I'm going to do at some point, I'm going to... I'd probably be a series of sermons on this topic. And so that was the first one. The second one uh, was family in general at 13%. uh, And then finances, 11%. So I'm going to be preaching on finances. I finally get to get that tithing sermon in there. So thank you for that. Uh, And then we've got uh, God's will for my life, right? 9%. God's will for my life. And then, of course, you've got sanctification, which is growing in spiritual maturity. That's going to be awesome. Probably do a series... Uh, on that. And then health, love for God, angels came in at 4%, uh, intimacy with God. And then on the second sheet, these were all your uh, 1% responses. So you've got questions like, why does evil exist? Helping others. Why am I not healed? Addiction, right? We're going to hit addiction pretty hard. And joy and prayer, uh, alcohol and marijuana. Genesis 19, that came in. We're going to preach on that. I'm not sure who submitted that, but it's interesting. So we'll, we'll, we'll go to Genesis 19. Revelation chapter 7 is another. Suffering, Satan, aging, illness, gossip, uh, how to be a faithful witness, and anger. So this is where we're going to be preaching at for probably the next two years. There's a lot of stuff here. You know, we've got to work in Easter. We've got another Advent season coming up next year. And so I imagine it'll take us some time to get through these. And I thought about putting dates out here by when I'm going to preach on these topics, but then you would know when your question is going to be preached on, and you may not come to the other services. So you've got to come every week so that you know, uh, you know you, your question may be preached on then. So keep this. Keep this. This is good. This is good data analysis for our church family. This is what, when you pray, when you go to the altar, you, you take this list with you, right? Because there's somebody sitting next to you that's struggling with something. There's somebody sitting next to you that wonders about some things, and this is, these are those responses. And so I want to open up service this morning. Romans 8.28. Romans 8.28 says this, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to His His purpose. And so we all go through things. And we all face things and God orchestrates those things to work together for our good. And a lot of these questions in these surveys, I'm I'm going to, they touch on multiple themes. So one question may be taught on three or four times. It may come up in different topics. But we've all got concerns. And what God promises is that our suffering is not pointless or meaningless. That we go through things and it's to, to, to give us, to lead us into repentance, to lead us into righteousness, to give us a reward for our suffering and to allow us to rejoice. And so this morning, uh, there, there's a verse in James 5.11 and it says this, You have heard of the steadfastness of Job and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. No matter what we go through, God's character never changes. He's full of mercy, He's full of kindness, of love, and of compassion. And so this morning, our theme for this service is how do you trust God in the dark? I promise that He's present in the dark. And I promise that you can trust Him, and He promises that He is kind, compassionate, merciful, and that He's looking at you. And your name is written on the palm of His hand. So take comfort this morning. Let us pray. 
Father, thank You so much for this day. Lord, we thank You for Your life that You've given us through Your precious Holy Spirit. We thank You, Lord, that You lead us into all truth. And Father, this morning we just dedicate our lives in this service unto You. Move mightily in this place. Uh, lift up the head of those who are burdened this morning, Lord. Thank You so much. We pray for miracles. We pray for transformations. We pray for spiritual maturity and growth this morning, Lord. We pray for the healing of diseases. We pray for, the, for people to be set free from addictions. We pray, Lord, that spiritual despondency be broken in the name of Jesus. And allow us this morning, Lord, to rejoice and to sing praises to You with all of our hearts. And in Your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Okay. All righty. Can I have those beautiful kids to come on up here and let's do this row today. And while you're coming up, I want to remind you that today in the van, I have several costumes from Campbellsville University. They were awesome to let us borrow, so I may bring those in. And if you have to stay for the finance committee meeting or if you just want to stay and take a look at them, we can start reserving um, costumes to see who looks good and what or who can wear what. Okay, today I'm going to talk to you about donkeys. I love me some donkeys. I have wanted a baby donkey for a long time. And the little, the little miniature donkeys, I think they're so cute. There him is. He is so cute. Then I started talking about donkeys and thinking about donkeys. And I thought, you know what? There are some serious donkeys in the Bible. There are some historic donkeys in the Bible. And I found this book. It's by R.C. Sproul. And it is The Donkey Who Carried the King. And it talks about donkeys in here. There was one donkey, and he had a master named Balaam. And Balaam was going to do a really wrong thing. He was going to go and say bad things about the people of God. He was going to prophesy against them. So God sent an angel. And the donkey was carrying Balaam, and the angel appeared. But only the donkey saw the angel, so the donkey stopped. Well, Balaam started whipping that donkey because he wasn't going. He was just stopping. And God gave the donkey power to speak. And the donkey said, What have I done to you to cause you to hit me? And Balaam, I'm sure, was really freaked out. But then God let Balaam see the angel. That was one historic donkey. Another historic donkey was a donkey that he had an owner named Joseph. Joseph was a carpenter. This donkey's name was Barnabas. Barnabas just happened to carry Joseph's wife Mary to a place called Bethlehem. There baby Jesus was born. Then Barnabas carried Mary and baby Jesus home again. Okay, but that brings me to Davy. Davy is this donkey. There's Davy. Okay, Davy was a young donkey, and all he got to do was stay in a pen. He didn't get to do anything. He just ate and stayed in the pen. Very, very bored. Well, one day, two men appeared, and Davy saw his owner talking to him, and now Davy's never got to do anything. Nobody's even sat on Davy's back before. Well, this man, two men came, and, and Davy's owner led him right out, and away Davy went with these men. And they took him to a town, and there a man got on his back. Well, he wasn't just any man. He was dressed in royal clothes, and Davy heard him call him Jesus. And you know what? He was a king. They treated him like a king. They threw coats on him. They even put some coats on Davy. They threw the coats on the ground and they were waving palm branches at him. Well, Davy, yeah, come on up here, baby girl. Davy thought he was something else. He was so proud. And he went back home and he didn't want to do anything else because he carried a king. Nothing else. I don't want to carry nothing else. 
What do you mean putting those olive baskets on my back? I'm not doing that. I carried a king. I am special. Well, as Davy unfortunately had to work, and he had to carry those branches, and he had to carry uh, olive baskets, one day another man came to get him, and they went to town. Well, there was a crowd. The crowd was furious. They were so angry at something. They were angry at, well, somebody. (gasps) Then Davy saw that man, that man they called Jesus. But now all the crowd's mad at him, and, and they've beat him, and he's got places on him, and he's bleeding, and they're making him carry this big old beam. And I don't understand this at all, and that upsets me. Then the master just made me, you know, go back to my pen. And, he, and then Davy got there, and Davy was talking to the old donkey, Barnabas. And Barnabas said, you know, I carried Jesus, and I carried Mary and I'm a servant. And he said, Davy, you're a servant. And he said, you see that king? He died for us because he's a servant. And how important it is to be a servant. So now Davy is very happy to be a servant because he's a servant like the king. Okay, thank you. <laughs> you can come up here and get your, you want to get your little grab bags? And then you can go back to your seats. Thank you so much. Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So the Word of God says, uh, Behold... I do a new thing, so we're going to do a new thing this morning. (laughs) Um, I'm not going to play, even though the piano is fixed. Uh, Thank you for for all the people that facilitated that. But we're going to have Miss Stacy play and Samuel play, and we're just going to sing along with that. The first song we're going to do is Holy, Holy, Holy. I've never sang it, so prayer warriors, start now. (laughs) But please stand and help us sing this song. It's actually in your hymnal 262, and we will do, uh, we'll try to do verses 1, 3, and 4.
Yes, it's all about you, Jesus. All about you, Lord. All about you, Jesus. I'll bring you more than a song. 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 Oh, you deserve it all, Jesus. I'll bring you more than a song. I'll bring you more than a song. King of endless worlds. Oh, bring you more than a song. I'll bring you more than a song. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. And it's all about you. Yes, it's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the things I've made it. When it's all about you, oh, it's all about you, Jesus. All about you. Bring you more than a song. I'll bring you more than a song. I'll bring you more than a So good to us. Well, let's praise His name this morning. Let's give Him our heart and soul. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I give you my heart, I give you my soul, and I live for you alone, every breath that I take, every moment I'm awake, Lord, have your way in me, Lord, I I give you my heart, I give you my soul, I live for you alone, every breath that I take, every moment I'm awake, Lord have your way in me. This is my desire to honor you, Lord, Lord, with all my heart, I worship you, yes, I do, oh, and all I Give 
This beautiful Sunday morning, Lord, we thank You for the light that You shine into our lives. We thank You for the peace that You give us, for the joy that You give us, and the air that You allow us to breathe, Father. Lord, I pray that You help me to preach this message this morning. Anoint me. Anoint our ears to hear Your Word, Lord, and and work by Your Spirit through the hearing of Your Word to transform us into Your image, Jesus. Father, I pray that You enable me to uh, preach Your Word in truth and in spirit. Holy Spirit, be right here in this pulpit. Be right there next to Your loved ones. Father, I pray, pour out understanding and revelation on us this morning. In Your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. And the worship team sound great this morning. Let's give them... I mean, that blesses my heart just to see a full worship team up here. and It sounded great. It was Spirit-led and anointed. So thank you all for obeying the Lord and doing that. If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Psalm. uh, And we're going to be looking at chapter 13 uh, this morning. And the title of uh, the sermon is Trusting God in the Dark. Trusting God in the Dark. Psalm 13. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Question. Will God answer my prayer about suffering, or will I always live in pain? Next question. Why do bad things happen to children? These were two of the questions that were part of the responses, and like I said, these are some tough questions. A lot of times we ask these things. Why do we see bad things all around us, or why am I going through 
this difficult time? Why? Why have I I've been praying for months and for years for this thing to happen and it and it hasn't happened yet and here I am all alone. Has God forgotten me or or why am I still going through this struggle? I'm sure these questions will carry over and in the multiple weeks we'll look at this. Why do we suffer and, and why sometimes it seems like our prayers aren't being answered and, and the Word of God absolutely guides us through that. And we pick up our author here in Psalm 13 and it's David. And David can relate to you. The Word of God can meet you in the midst of that darkness and that trial. David was going through something here. And, and we don't know what he was going through. And I think that's actually more beneficial to us. We don't know what he was facing in this particular incident. It could be a lot of reasons. Maybe he was running for his life. Or, or maybe he was uh, dealing with something else. But the bottom line is this. He was asking, as we often do, how can I trust God in difficult times? Has anybody been there? I wonder, how can I trust God in difficult times? So there's three sections in this chapter, right? There's verse 1, 2, verses 3 and 4, verses 5 and 6. can be divided into three topics. Number one, uh, we can look at David's condition. Number two, in verses 3 and 4, we can look at David's cry. And number three, in verses 5 and 6, we can look at his consolation. So his condition, his cry, and his consolation. First, his condition. Verses 1 and 2, again. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? Can somebody resonate with that clause of Scripture right there? I believe you can because I feel like maybe I heard it as I was reading this. Somebody has sorrow in your heart this morning. And God wants you to know that He sees that sorrow and He's going to meet that sorrow and He's going to lift you up through that sorrow and bring you to a place of rejoicing. Hallelujah and Amen. Back to our text. And have sorrow in my heart all the day. How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? So, so David is asking here, how long? How long must I go through this? How long must my enemies laugh at me? How long must I be disappointed? How long must I battle this depression? How long, Lord? We often say the same thing. How how long? And it makes us feel a lot of different ways. And we can look at how it made David feel. First, it made him feel forgotten and forsaken. Can you see it out there on an island all alone? Can you picture yourself maybe all alone and you're asking God, how long must I go through this? And you feel forgotten. You feel forsaken. It's like never getting invited to that, to that party when everybody else has been invited. And you're there. You're left off the list. Everybody's invited but you. Everybody else is going to this party but you. You're not on the list, right? So you're home all alone. Or it's like catching a bus and everybody else gets on the bus. You've got somewhere to be. You've got to get on the bus to catch a boat to go on a cruise, right? And there you are. Everybody gets on the bus. The bus takes off and there you are sitting on a bench all alone. Maybe it's like everybody else laughing and having a good time and they're full of joy and they're, they're high-fiving their friends and, and they're having a good time and you don't know what they're laughing about. You don't know what they're talking about. They're just having a good time and there you sit all alone, isolated, forgotten, forsaken. Can anybody relate? Isolated not only from Dave, not only from human relationship, but isolated from God. What could be worse, right? You're not only isolated, you don't go to the party, you don't get on the bus, you don't have fun with your friends, 
So not only are you left alone, but it seems like God has abandoned you in the middle of the darkness. And in the midst of this, David's perceptions are not accurate. This is a message for us to be aware of our perceptions during this time. And what David is saying, God, you've forgotten me. And you this morning may be saying, God, you've forgotten me. Here I am struggling. I've been going through this battle and there's been no breakthrough. God, why have you forgotten me? The message from Scripture is clear. God has not forgotten you. It's happened before. It's happened before when the children of Israel were leaving uh, Egypt and they're out there in the wilderness traveling and they ask God, have you forgotten us? In Isaiah, it says this, chapter 49. But Zion, Zion you can replace, that's God's people. Right? That's Israel. That's, that's God's people. And today, God's people could be crying out this same thing. Isaiah 49, 14, But Zion said, The Lord has forsaken me. My Lord has forgotten me. So whenever you cry out, God has forgotten me, you are not the first person to ever say that or to pray that prayer or to cry that out loud. Out of God's people, there have been others that have come before you that have said, God, why have you forgotten me? But that's not an accurate assessment of the situation. Look at the next uh, two verses in Isaiah. This is, what, this is how God responds, right? So His people cry out, Why have you forgotten me? God responds with this, Can a woman forget her nursing child that she would have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, yet I will not forget you. Behold, I have engraved you on the palm of my hands. It's God's message to you this morning. When I read that, I looked, what's a good illustration of that? And I looked down at my, at my hand and I said, well, I see this ring. And, and any time I, I look at this ring, if you were to ask me, am I married? I'll say yes, absolutely, to the most gorgeous woman in the world, the most beautiful woman in the world, the greatest singer, the best wife in the world, Amanda Jo Root. I, I needed some points. That's good. <laughs> that's not in my notes. That's spontaneous. That's, that's good job, preacher. So yes, I would answer, yeah, I'm married. But when I look down at my hand and I see this ring, it reminds me of a covenant I made with my wife. It reminds me, even though she may not be in the room, I can look down at my hand and see, yes, there she is. God does the same thing with you. He says, your name is written on His hand. He looks down and says, there they are. He's not forgotten you. He sees you in the struggle that you're, that you're going through. And he says, there they, there they are. But David here, he doesn't realize that. He doesn't realize that. And he says, how long, God, will you forget me? How long will you forget me? And our relationship with God is sometimes like the sun. You, you can't see it, right? The sun may be shrouded by clouds and it may be a rainy day, a snowy day. Like it's been here for like years it seems like. And you can't see the sun. But I promise you the sun is there. And whatever you're going through at times, it seems like God is not around. But I promise you He is there. Scripture says that creation teaches us about God and His relationship with us. That's one of the examples. So, David, he's forgotten and he's forsaken, right? But he's also sorrowful. He's also sorrowful and, and he's subdued, right? So not only is he isolated, but he's depressed, right? He's in the middle of this thing and he's full of sorrow and he's in the midst of it all and, and his bones are decaying. He's full of depression, right? This thing has been weighing on him for a long, long time. What's weighing on you? Has it got you down? Has it got you sorrowful? Are you full of dread? Are you tired of fighting? And David is saying this is like vinegar in an open wound. Can't get no relief. 
Like vinegar in an open womb. And, and he could hear his enemies laughing in his ears. Man, isn't that an example of sometimes the battles that we face? We can hear our enemies mocking us. Our enemies may be other people or it may be addictions. It may be depression. It may be false assumptions. It could be idols. But they're laughing in our ears and it's ringing throughout our ears all day long. Sorrowful and subdued. Have you been here? Have you been here? And, and there's some things which accompany this feeling. Man, I know I have. I've been there multiple times in my life. And, and, and a nice, clean, cut and dry statement would be that, yeah, I felt like this, but then I got saved and I never felt like this again. But that's not a truthful statement and that's not even a biblical statement. Because as God's people, we sometimes go through some things and it teaches us about the grace of God. It teaches us to grow in trust. But maybe you're there this morning and, and if you are, there's some things which accompany this feeling. I'm talking about depression. I'm talking about spiritual depression. I'm talking about being overwhelmed with the challenges of life. I'm talking about feeling like you're defeated all of the, the time. Right? There's some things which accompany this. Number one, you waste time. Man, I can give a first-hand report from behind enemy lines on this. You waste time. You don't feel like waking up in the morning. You, you, you're so overwhelmed with darkness and despondency and, and depression. And man, you can't even, you don't want to wake up. When you go to bed the night before, you might be even be hoping that you never, ever see the earth again. I'm talking about a real life depression, a spiritual darkness, right? I'm talking about sometimes we go through these things and we waste time. We don't want to get up and do anything. We just want to, we kind of want to check out. This is the, 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 the epiphany of what checking out means. This is just absolutely checking out, not buying into anything, uh, just avoiding your responsibilities, absolutely avoiding meeting other people, just absolutely saying you're done with life. That's one of the things you can do when you're going through darkness. That, that, that was my default response. Sleep to 2.30 in the evening. I'm talking about a depth of depression, guys. A depth of addiction. A depth of sorrow to where you don't want to put your head up out of the cupboard. Another response is to work yourself like a maniac. To where you're so full of despondency that, that that's not your response. You don't check out. You buy in. And so you do all of these things, right? You, you do all of these things that, that, that are just uh, routine and you're doing, 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 doing because you're distracting yourself. Both are two extreme responses to the same core issue of spiritual darkness. And frustration rises. Bitterness rises. And we're afraid of doing normal things. And we're rocked to the core, right? I'm talking about traveling through the, the, the depth of this darkness. And what are we going to do? I wrote down three things that we're going to do before I get to my next point. I promise my first point on the condition is longer than the next two. The cry and the consolation. But while we're here in the condition, three things. If you're taking notes, jot this down. Number one, don't make any big decisions during this time about marriage, about uh, a house, about, about a job. Just shelf it for a while while you're going through this. You're going to come out the other side, but I'm telling you right now, while you're going through this absolute storm of darkness, don't make any big decisions. And number two, do not, do not judge your spiritual life by this. I want you to listen to me here. Don't judge your spiritual life by the darkness that you're facing, Right? Because I promise you, as men and women of God, we will go through some things. It doesn't mean that you're a bad Christian, right? Sure, sin has consequences, but sometimes we face things because God has taken us on a journey. It doesn't mean that we're less of a Christian or not a Christian or that we have little faith or no faith. So stop that. Don't judge yourself when you go through these dark times. And number three, don't judge other people. Don't judge other people because they're going through a tough time. Pray with them. Pray for them. Be by their side. But don't judge their spiritual life. We all go through this, guys. 
And many servants of God have gone through this. We know Job, as we read in the beginning, Job went through this, and David went through this, Jonah went through this, John Wesley went through this, Charles Spurgeon went through this. These times of the dark night of the soul, when, when we feel darkened and we feel uh, depressed and no way out. And honestly, guys, some people fight this more than others. Be real about it. Some people fight this more than, than, than others. And, and it's not always spiritual, right? It's not always spiritual. It can be physical. We can be tired in going through these things. But sometimes it is spiritual and we've got to do spiritual warfare. And oftentimes these seasons will come on the heels of a great success. Question. Why does something bad Follow something good. I don't know if any of you have experienced this, but you go through a mountaintop experience and things are good. You just had a major victory. Things are going well. And then I'll be daggone the next day. Man, you're hit right in the face with something. Right? And you're like, why does this always happen? Why do I feel like He-Man one day? I feel like Paul the Super Saint. And then the next day I feel like Judas, right? I feel like, I, or Peter, like I've betrayed Christ. And I'm going, I'm driving a Cadillac one day and then it's a Hyundai the next. And not, if you have a Hyundai, that's great. That's fine. It just rhymed, so I used it. Hyundai may be better. Anyway, so, so you feel you got good days and bad days, right? Elijah. Elijah, right? He's, he's against the false prophets of Baal. And, and he's like, I challenge you guys. My God is bigger than your God. And they say, all right, let's go out to the mountain. That's like saying, okay, let's go out to the backyard, out by the flagpole. We'll, we'll deal with it after school. And so Elijah goes out there. The prophets of Baal are out there. And they say, call down fire. And Elijah prays. Fire comes down and it destroys all of the false idols. Triumph. Victory, right? But we look at the next chapter, and there's Elijah sitting underneath a tree, crying. Crying. Just seen God move in a mighty way. Now he's underneath a broom tree, crying, depressed. An angel comes up to him and says, Elijah, what's going on? What are you... What, what's going on? He says, oh, I'm the only one in all of the earth that serves God, that loves God. And I'm the only one that's going to carry the mantle. And, and in reality, he wasn't. But he's crying, which brings us to our second point. David's cry, verses 3 and 4. Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. So the cry, guys, the cry is important. When you're going through something, it's important to let it out. It's important to not hold it in. It's important to cry out. But even more important than that is who you cry out to. David here cries out to God. And, and it does us no good. It does you no good when you deny the battle that you're going through. When you deny that darkness that you're going through. When you repress your feelings that you're going through that thing. And you don't tell anybody else about it. Your first response, right, is to cry out to God. Let Him know all about it. Don't pretend your shoulders are too broad than what they really are. You cry out to your Father and say, God, help me to get through this thing. Consider me, O oh God, like David says here in verse 3. Consider me. And I do believe, guys, that you can go through a despondency and a depression which can lead to death. I do believe that, that people can die from, from broken hearts. And, and what David is saying here, he's saying, look at me, lighten up my eyes, consider me God, look at me, don't let me die here. Have you prayed that prayer? 
If you prayed that prayer, maybe you're going through something and there's nobody else in this church house that knows what you're going through and you feel isolated, you feel sorrowful, you feel subdued, right? And the first thing I want you to know is that you're crying out to God and that He hears you and that He's with you. Have you prayed that prayer? Have you cried out to God? Don't let me die here. David saying, God, turn the lights back on. David saying, God, turn the lights back on. And the thing is, God doesn't always do that when we want Him to. And sometimes uh, the, the, the major testimonies occur uh, in the middle of those dark times uh, when our trust in God grows, right? We always want to talk about uh, the highlight moments, right? The six years of, of sobriety or this and that. And God absolutely has made us more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. But honestly and truthfully, a lot of the miracles happen in the middle of the dark season. It's in the middle of the dark seasons that your reliance upon God grows. Whereas before you trusted in things, you trusted in people and modalities and methodologies, but now you've gone through this thing and your trust in God is growing. That's when the miraculous is occurring. In the middle of those dark times, our hope is found in the grace that's discovered. Number three, David's consolation. His condition, his cry, and finally his consolation. Verses 5 and 6. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because He has dealt bountifully with me. And so what's the bridge that gets us from verse 4 to verse 5, right? Verse 4, 1 through 4, sorrow, dejection, isolation, loneliness, despondency, questioning God on everything. And then in verse 5, we see a dramatic turnaround. Why? What's the difference? The answer is prayer. The answer is prayer. Prayer allows David to do three things. To trust, to rejoice, and to sing. Through prayer, his perspective is changed. And now he can trust God. Now he can rejoice in what God is doing. And now he can sing to God. Guys, when you go through something, don't erect a monument to your disappointment. And you're going through something, whatever it may be, Judy, whatever it may be, if it's, if it's sickness, if it's addiction, and you're going through something, you don't erect monuments and celebrate it. You don't raise up an idol to say, this is me, this is who I am. And then when you get away from that thing, you begin to look back over your shoulder and you begin to say, yeah, that has my name on it. That's me. And then you go back and you say, wow, woe is me. Look at this disappointment in my life. And you seem to build your entire life around that thing. You know what I'm talking about. Everything that happens to you is brought into, brought by the light of that event and of that disappointment. Whether it be uh, if you were an addict for so long, or whether it be if you suffered this, you suffered that, everything is brought in relation to that event. The message of the gospel is to destroy that monument. Let it go, right? Don't identify with that. Uh, identify with being a blood-bought Christian uh, following Jesus. And when the devil takes your mind back to those major disappointments, to those things, three things you're to do. Rejoice. Allow your trust to grow. And to sing. You may not be experiencing the victory now. The devil reminds you of the failure that you went through. And the devil reminds you of that disappointment that you experienced. It may have even been last night or this morning. You don't dwell there. Don't let him take your head and hold you under the water uh, at, the, at, at the altar of that disappointment. But children of God, what I'm saying is, is when he takes you there, you say, no devil. You say, God, I'll trust in you. I'll rejoice in you. And I'm going to sing my way out of this thing. Fight. Fight. You are made more than a conqueror. You are made more than an overcomer. Get up and fight. Rejoice. Trust. And sing. 
You're not going out of this world like that. The devil's not going to take you out. Listen to me. And don't get caught up in feeling sorry for yourself. Don't keep playing the tape over and over and over and over. Sure, what happened to you was wrong. Let it go. Don't feel sorry for yourself. And and these storms of life uh, will one day be stilled. But until then, trust God. Rejoice and, and sing. Because God is wise and He's holding on to you. Allow your trust to grow. It's in these experiences that we understand God's grace and taste more of God's grace. And remember that Hebrews says that that Jesus is the anchor for our souls, guys. That Jesus is our anchor. And our faith is not in ourselves. Our faith is in Jesus who is holding on to us. I'd like to ask the worship team if they come to their instruments and prepare an invitational song. I want to ask you three questions this morning. Nobody moving around, nobody thinking about what we're doing when we get out of here, thinking about this moment and what the Holy Spirit is saying to you right now. Number one, do you need a touch from God this morning? Are you fighting something, guys, that you've not told another soul about that only God knows about and you feel heavy and this message has spoken to you? It seems like God or that I'm speaking right to you. That's the Holy Spirit speaking to you this morning. Do you need a touch from God? Number two, are you feeling overwhelmed? Are you feeling overwhelmed? Are you tired? We all go through these seasons, guys, and this is what a church is for, right? This is what a church is for, so that we come together and we encourage one another and that we gather at the feet of Jesus and then we link arms with one another and we walk through this thing. And we're not supposed to be suffering in isolation. We're not supposed to be dealing with abuse or addiction or, or, or just sort of anything. We're not supposed to deal with it alone. We're supposed to cry out to God and we're supposed to speak to others and we gather strength from each other. And we get through this thing, right? And God gets the glory. Are you tired? Are you overwhelmed? Do you need a touch from God? I'd like to ask if everybody would please stand. Remember guys, when we go through these difficult times, we're to trust God. We're to rejoice and we're to sing. I want you to find a place this morning where you can allow your trust in God to grow, where you can rejoice. And and as they sing, sing with all of your heart. A lot of times that's when chains are broken. If you need prayer, come down front. This is not an altar of shame. This is not about who sinned this week. This is not about who's a lousy Christian. This is an altar of grace and compassion. This is where God meets needs. This is where chains are broken. This is where grace is experienced. Come forward if you need a touch from God. If you're feeling overwhelmed, if you're tired, we'll meet you here. Don't leave here this morning the same way that you came. God is waiting. Jesus has His arms open out to you. He's saying, come near to me.
of what happens to us in our weeks in our days that you've never left us Lord help us cry out to you whenever we feel isolated or sad or disappointed in the world and in ourselves but we know you are faithful because you've never left us because you said you'll not leave us nor forsake us we read this in the Bible and we believe it. We thank you. We thank you for all that you are doing, that you've done in our hearts, Lord. Keep us um, embedded into your love. Lord, as we, as we depart, Lord, I pray that your presence will go with us. You will give peace and surely uh, peace and mercy, your love and kindness will follow us for the rest of our days. In Jesus' most precious name I pray. Amen.
Father, we thank you so much for the uh, life you give us. We thank you, Lord, that uh, you are with us. We, we are never left alone. And, Lord, we thank you that as we go through tough times, Lord, that uh, you enable our trust in you to grow, our faith to grow. And, Lord, that you allow us to rejoice and to sing. And so, Lord, we thank you so much. Father, I pray that you go with your people today. Lord, watch over your people protect, lead, and guide, and give them favor, Father. Uh, allow us to be good witnesses for you this week, Lord, and, and to speak a word of encouragement to somebody else who may be going through a dark time. And Lord, lift up your face upon us, make your countenance shine upon us, and give us your peace. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. You are dismissed. Robert.